it's one of those days where I feel the weight of the world upon my shoulders. So I will talk about it. I will talk about it because I had a discussion with an unemployed friend of mine about how there is way too much toxic positivity around. I posted a status about how Christians are very good at toxic positivity. We are. And the sad thing is it's people who it's it's people who we don't expect it from. So it comes unexpectedly, which means we're not ready. We're not bracing ourselves for it. We can't avoid it. Toxic positivity is when you basically belittle someone's situation or condition. So I'll be specific for me. If I tell you, well, I went to the rheumatologist today and this is what happened. The doctor said the disease is progressing. And then you say, oh, well, at least there's hope for another medication. Okay, now I've just told you that we're waiting for approval for that medication. I've just told you that it will cost us much more for that medication. And then you're just telling me, well, at least there's hope for that, for another medication. Firstly, that invalidates my whole experience, which is I'm in pain. My disease is getting worse. The medication will not halt the disease. Even if it halted the disease, right, you know, stopped it right where it is now. I would forever have pain because my bones are already d damaged. So the medication, hope, doesn't solve my problem because one, it wouldn't solve my problem <laughs> anyway. Two, it would cost much more. Are you going to give me the money to, to pay for this extra cost? Where will the money come from? Thirdly, it doesn't look at my here and now. My here and now is right now. I am sitting and I'm in pain. Right now, I am pulling myself, forcing myself to move. I am fatigued. I am tired. But I have to keep going. Right now, what the at least does is it invalidates the here and now of the person who is talking to this toxically positive person. And it also means that the toxically positive person is not sitting with the talker the sufferer in their situation. They're not listening. They're not hearing. If they're Christian, they definitely don't have compassion. You can't have compassion unless you understand what you're being compassionate about. And for that, you have to then get into the, pe the person's shoes as much as you can. You can only be compassionate when you know what the person is dealing with. But if you are so insistent on looking at the positive, then you haven't opened your eyes nor your heart to what the person is dealing with. Therefore, you have no compassion to show them. It's telling them it could be worse. But right now, they are bad is bad. And interestingly, the people who say this, they're not living in any bad, generally. That is the worst part. I'd understand if I'm talking to someone who's got, I don't know, ALS. But I would understand if someone with AL, if I complained about pain, or my neck not moving properly to someone with ALS who is locked into their body and the only thing they can do is use their eyes to communicate you know like with those eye gaze things they have that technology which I don't even know we have if we have it in South Africa know how expensive it is so that I would understand because wow I have it better I really do have it better than someone who's locked in with ALS Google or read real stories of people with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, motor neuron disease. That makes sense. Or if I'm talking about how the children are all sick with the flu, I would understand someone who's lost all their children saying, yeah, at least your children are alive. You see, it, it makes sense because they're looking at, they're looking at the situation and they would rather have living children than no children. They're looking at it from their lens, but at least it, it makes sense. It makes sense because they're in a worse bit situation. But if, but mostly it's said by people who are employed to someone who's not employed. And most of the time, those people are not trying to make the life of the unemployed person any easier. They're not because they're not thinking. They're not compassionate. So they're not thinking about what it's like to be unemployed. 
how are you sitting there with no food no food no money for electricity no money for clothing no money to replace broken shoes if we sat in that situation we would never say at least it will be whatever or you will find a job when when will they find the job that's another example of toxic positivity making fake prophecies because it is a fake prophecy you don't know that they'll find a job some people have died gone to their graves never having found that job always relying on others and it kills them i don't mind giving i wish i could give more but for the recipient generally unless they're entitled it is galling it is horrible constantly needing to be fed by someone else it really is Telling them they will get a job, it doesn't fix the situation right now. It doesn't give them electricity. It doesn't give them um, shoes. It doesn't give them new underwear, does it? It doesn't help. Toxic positivity doesn't help. It doesn't reduce the person's suffering for you, who's not going to hire them, to tell them they'll get a job. We both know that's sometimes not even true. And in the meantime, what about tomorrow? Where will they find the food to eat tomorrow and today and yesterday? What were they eating? You'll find a job doesn't feed anybody who's unemployed. It doesn't help them. They know they will find a job. Well, they know they will find a job. That is why they keep looking for jobs. That's why they keep sending through applications. It's not helping. They live on that hope. But hope doesn't feed you and doesn't fill your stomach. So here I am today, I walk through the pharmacy and it was stiff, my legs were stiff. I could, I was walking like, like I'm stiff, like a robot, like I'm made of tin. And I imagined all the people who've said, oh, well, at least you know what it is. Okay, I know what it is, but it hasn't stopped the progression of the disease. And so we come to autism and grief. Toxic positivity doesn't get rid of the grief that we live with, always. It's constant grief, it's recurring, it's cyclical. It's always there, it, it's at the background, it's buzzing in many autism parents' heads, especially when the children, whether it's level one or level two or level three, there's always a sense of grief for that child. It's grief because of what they're going through. Even a level one, whatever high functioning, Look at Susan Boyle. I would maybe say she's high functioning. I don't know what level she would have been. But when she was upset because her brother didn't come fetch her, she suffered. She screamed in the airport. She was all alone. Saying at least she can talk doesn't help the suffering that Susan Boyle went through more than once at the airport all alone. It doesn't negate the emotions that she went through. And so we parents go through, on our children's behalf, the emotions, the suffering they go through. We carry it. We carry the pain of their limitations. You know, we try and be brave, some of us. We post, oh, I would never take away my child's autism. It makes them who they are. But then you see the reality, the comments. I would, I've said, I think I've said it before, the one that stuck out to me. Well, I assume the person, the father, he's a father of autistic children. He said he wouldn't, if there was a pill, I assume he said if there was a pill, he wouldn't give it to his children to get rid of their autism, to his two sons, I think. And one autistic person, amongst many, said, well, if there was a pill, I would take it to get rid of my autism. And that's the thing. Yes, one or two autistic people might be totally happy. And then I bet you their parents are happy too. But for the rest of us autistic people are not autistic <laughs> those who don't like being autistic and the parents of those children it is ongoing grief because tomorrow they will still be autistic today they are autistic you have to go through today's 24 hours of autism with your child yes the other people who deny that their children have special needs the parents who deny that the children are dyslexic and then therefore hold them back from getting the support they need which makes life much harder. But there are parents who fully accept their children's diagnoses 
and fully absorb what that means for their children. You can't really help your child and that causes grief. Tomorrow when they can't get hold of themselves, it will cause you grief. When my son goes ballistic, if he hasn't taken his respital, or if he I took it too late, he will go crazy. He will start shouting and kicking and yelling. And it has an impact on him because he's feeling upset. That's the thing. It's not about how I feel about his misbehavior. It's that he is feeling a lot of negative emotion. And that hurts you as a parent. So you as a parent who is grieving your child's diagnosis over and over and over. It is normal. If you love your child, you will grieve for them on their behalf. There's also grief for the child we will never have. Or the child we do not have and we are not guaranteed we will ever have. It's easy to dismiss autism if all you know is the ones who got the PhD. You know, you get, I love those stories. I've shared them where the guy didn't talk until he was 14 and then phew, he was able to study full time and get a PhD. Someone even shared something like that today about a 12 year old. He only started talking at 12 and then he got a PhD. Sorry, I need to check the time because at 10, my children will come and ask for something for their iPads. So we don't, we live in hope. Now I've disturbed myself, distracted myself. We live in hope, but for now, right now, that child is not talking. Right now, that child also has other disabilities or disorders that mean they might never get a PhD anyway. Generally, intellectually challenged people who are impaired intellectually, they can't get that PhD. So it's not only autism, it's autism and what it has come with. Also, that we grieve as loving parents. Please, if you're autistic, know this. We grieve because we love you. We see how it disturbs you. And we worry also. Two or three weeks ago, I actually, I actually panicked. I myself panicked. Let me interrupt myself right now. And I hope I'll remember speech, communication disorder. Autism includes communication disability of some sort, whether non-speaking at all or, yeah, I'll be back. Okay, communication. So, about two weeks ago, I really, I cannot express the panic unless you've lived it. I can't make you feel it, but I will try. I went into my room, into my girls, my daughter's room. And Marissa, my nine-year-old, was with Uri Neile, Neilo, or Nene, um, who's four, who is our more talking twin, the most talkative twin. And she was crying. Nene was crying. And I asked, what's up? And she said, Amrissa, oh, she said, I can't talk. My four-year-old said, I can't talk. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. And then she was talking funny. She was saying, I can't talk. And I thought, okay, she had a stroke. My mind just went into neurolo neurological issue. Temporary stroke, TIA, temporary ischemic attack, whatever, whatever TIA stands for. But I thought, stroke, I can't talk. And then she was crying, I can't talk. And I said, okay, wait, can you say boot? And she said, boot. So I thought, okay, so what is it? Is her brain not allowing her to say what she wants to say, which is what so many nonverbal autistics complain about, that there's like a concrete wall or a block and their mouth can't say what their brain wants to say. Guys, I cannot explain. I thought, I can't have two children who can't speak. That will be just too much. Two children who can't explain or express themselves. How will I handle this? My inside, my heart was panicking. And eventually it turned out that she didn't have the word, just one word for what she wanted to say. And because she needed that word, she couldn't say her sentence. So it turned out eventually that she had noticed that my daughter has a gap and she doesn't have the word for gap. And she wanted to know if her teeth will break. She wants her teeth to break like her big sisters. <sighs> I was just so thankful that Amarissa had, they'd had enough of a conversation to explain to me why she was so upset and for me to put the words into her mouth. And finally, she was relaxed and I said to you, see my angel, you can talk. And both of us relaxed and her tears stopped flowing. 
And I think that's part of why we constantly grieve as parents of non-communicators, because in a way, that's what our non-verbal and non-picture choosing children are, in a way. They want to communicate, but for us, it doesn't come back. It doesn't come to us. So I can't say not communicators, but unable to communicate, disabled. Um, we we don't know what's in their heads. We don't know when they're upset. We don't know when they're sad. We don't know when what they're angry about. When they get angry, we can only tell there's something when they are when they lash out. But when it's still building, when it's still minor, we have no clue. And that is something we will grieve for ever or until it changes. And so we live in hope. That's the other thing. We live in hope that, okay, maybe today she will say a sentence or a phrase or express a wish or a hope or a desire or just call me mommy. Just so I know that she doesn't. So that not because I want the label, but so I know that when she sees me, she does know that is my mother and what that means. I don't know what she's know what she knows. So I go in and I will teach her, or I'll try, because you know there's this thing there's AAC alternative and augmentative communication devices. So if they don't speak, then you can sign. My daughter doesn't want to sign. Okay, so then you try pictures. My daughter doesn't really she doesn't look at pictures. She you will go in, but she won't look at any. She won't look at the picture. She'll take the pictures and start building a tower with them. Or she'll make a line with them. But if you're pointing at a chair, she's in, she's, I hate the, I know many autistics don't like the word, the phrase in their own world, but she appears to be in her own world, not in mine. There is no shared attention. How can you not grieve that over and over and over? If I can't, teach her the word for knee, how will she ever tell me that her knee is sore? How will I know that her elbow is fractured? As like I did with my four-year-old, she had cried, she had said her arm is sore, she had shown me, it had blown up, and then it went down again. By the time we got to the hospital, her arm looked normal, and because she wasn't showing pain, the doctor brushed it off, she's fine. And he, he refused to believe me when I said she needed an x-ray. He even told me that I'm going to give her cancer because she's having an unnecessary x-ray. Only to find she, her elbow had been fractured. But how can I speak for my child if she hasn't told me in any way, any shape or form, that she's got a problem? How will I be her voice if she herself hasn't found a way to show herself? She hasn't found her own voice. You grieve. And for all parents, whatever the issue is that their child has, any disability, they grieve. Child is in a wheelchair, they grieve. They would rather their child could walk. Wheelchair and accessibility issues out, out there in the world, even in your own bathtub, bathing. Look. Yes, they're alive. Yes, they can talk those who can. But even that mother with a child who can talk, who can go to university and sail through and also get their PhD, she grieves. And I understand that grief. You will not say it to her. I might think it. that Well, I wish at least. Because, see, I will think it because my situation is worse. I am living her. It could be worse. But I will still keep it to myself, and not only because I studied psychology, so I know how we should be a psychologist, but because that is called compassion. So when I tell you I'm gonna have surgery, and you say, well, at least it'll sort out your problem. The issue is I shouldn't have a problem that needs sorting out. It's not the norm. We don't all go around having problems and needing surgery. That person has, I think, only had one surgery in her whole life, only one can't count how many I've had. In fact, when the, the anesthetist asked last week, how many surgeries have you had? I told him too many to count. I don't, that, we're not even going to go there. My, it's, my kidney function is still mildly decreased. It's at like what you would call a stage two. But hey, it could be worse. It's fine if I tell myself that. But for you to tell me that means you're not taking into account that yikes. Your kidney function is not good. 
I have taken it into account because I'm living it. And so that's the thing. Let us find our positives. Let us find our own positives. And when we want to feel the grief and acknowledge that grief on that particular day, please let us acknowledge the grief. The grief, when we acknowledge it, doesn't mean we spend all day in a funk, as, as the Americans would say. We don't spend all day thinking, oh, my life is miserable. My daughter doesn't want to point at Tommy. She doesn't want to look at the page when I look and say, look, Tommy. We don't live all day like that. There are moments, and I'm privileged. That is why I can smile to answer the rheumatologist as well, because it can be worse. She will come and go into me with her back so I can hug her. She will randomly, um, bending over, maybe fixing her shoe, she will kiss me. She's in there. She sees me. So I will, I will be thankful for those moments. I'll be thankful for the moments she's in the bath and quiet. But it's the norm. It's the default. That doesn't mean we don't appreciate it. But it's the default. It should be like that. Every child should be happy. And more importantly, every child should be happy all the time. I really have no direction for this video except to ask that let us be more mindful of the words we speak when we listen to someone who is telling us about a bad situation. Let us truly try to feel their, their reality. Let us honor their feelings. Obviously, if they say, if I write and say, hey, Pogazi, I'm really feeling down and I just can't go on. My hips don't want to move properly and my SI joints are sore. I can't sleep day and night. Please just tell me, what can I do? Help, just find me something positive that I can cling to. That's different. Then she is definitely justified in then finding something positive because I asked her to. But in the moment, if she asks, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? And I tell her, I'm just telling her how I'm feeling. It doesn't mean that I'm depressed and I'm going to go kill myself. So she doesn't need to tell me, oh, well, appreciate your life. I didn't say I don't appreciate it. I didn't say another one is God is in control. Sorry for going, changing, going off, like changing or going off topic. God is in control. Christians and toxic positivity. God is in control. Okay. That's nice to know. I know that. It also comes across as patronizing. That's the other thing. And it's telling us, go look forward to heaven. Um, but we're not going tomorrow to heaven. I don't have just a 24 hour wait for the AS and then tomorrow I know, I know tomorrow there will be no more AS. We both have the same knowledge, but that knowledge does not reduce the suffering of today, nor does it take away the suffering that will come tomorrow. So dear Christians, don't tell us God is in control when we tell you something bad. We know that firstly, and secondly, the bad thing doesn't disappear. Poof! Just because you said God is in control. Just because you say, oh, keep on praying. This song really gives me strength. It doesn't mean that when you send that song to me, I never asked for the song, that it will give me strength. It will not change the pain. Listening to a hundred songs during the day will not take away the pain at night when I can't sleep. It will not change the arthritis in my neck and my shoulder. It will not take away this trapped on the nerve that I've got. No amount of verses will take away, will reverse damage. So please just sit with us in the moment. If we say to you, I'm collecting many, I'm collecting verses that talk about hope, please send me a verse on hope. That's different. Send many. But please listen to us and don't assume from the silence. If we are silent and if we're not saying, but hey, it's okay, at least I can see it, then don't tell me, well, at least you're not blind. Don't assume that we're not thankful for sight. We are. I just want you to try and imagine. That's what I want. I'm asking you, instead of being positive on behalf of someone else, try and imagine what it would be like to be them. Close your eyes. Say to yourself, okay, if I was Tandy or if I was Maxine or whoever, 
and I was going through this, how would I feel? And is my default response going to change this Maxine's situation? No, it won't. So let me not give my default response. Let me react to Maxine in the pain she's currently in. Let me say, I'm so sorry. Or let me say, that must be hard. Or let me ask, how are you feeling now emotionally? Do you have any support? If you're Christian, you will say, I will pray for strength because I don't know how you do this with a smile. That is Christian compassion. It's not toxic. It's not trivializing. It's not patronizing. It's loving. And as for us who grieve and will continue to grieve, I would love it if our supporters knew that or stayed cognizant of that. Even when we're quiet, when we're not talking about the bad times or the hard thing that happened today, please know that we live in a state of constant grief and be kinder, gentler. Send us random messages telling us you love us. Really, that's sometimes that's all we need, just random, hey, I haven't forgotten you or hey, I hope you're having a good moment or I hope the last hour hasn't been taxing. That's all we need to know that we are seen and that our grief is noted and that you grieve with us. I wish I could change things for all of us, but I can't. And so I will speak on behalf of all of us who feel like me, of course. More importantly, I hope that we will all care about each other because also I don't want to become so... Here's the, here's the thing, an example I thought of to round this off. There are two people. I have IBS. Well, I do have IBS. It's constipation, that type, not diarrhea. And so I can be constipated for six weeks, two months when there's a flare up, right? And it comes with other side effects, symptoms, headache, sleepless nights, fatigue, etc. I've got two friends. Both of them are experiencing constipation. Because I too am compassionate and I will put myself in their shoes. How will I feel if I'm always healthy and regular and then suddenly I'm not and my stomach starts to hurt? How will I feel to be them? I must also put myself in their shoes, even if their shoes are not as heavy as mine. They're still shoes. They're still wearing them. I will sit with you because you have sat with me. And so it's give and take. Give and take. God is in control, but it doesn't undo the damage that has been done to the world, to us, to our children, to our bodies. We also are thankful for when things are not bad, and we are thankful, I promise you, we are thankful for the things that could be worse. But bad will not stop from being bad. And we, will li we live that badness all day and all night. And, more and also, I hope that those of us who are in the badness, we can still see the beauty in the world. That we don't ignore the beautiful flower growing in the crack pavement. That we don't stomp on it. Suffering doesn't give us a pass to be cruel or uncaring or not compassionate. My suffering doesn't mean that you're not suffering, even if it's different levels. And I've seen friends who complain that, no, but it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I mean, yours is worse. Yes, it's worse, but you are going through something and I want to go through it with you. And for everyone who's asked, how do you feel? What does this mean for you? I appreciate that too. It's, that's all I need sometimes, just for you to ask. If you can't say anything, tell me something. Asking is just as good. <sighs> May our hearts be strengthened for the grief that is to come and the grief that we are living today.